It is a great honor and a privilege to introduce Wolf Muscovitz, Professor Muscovitz, we're here in Yerushalayim, and you are a world authority on the Shoah, on Ukraine. So if you could just mention a little bit about, just a bit of a history, where you were born, and a little bit about your history. A little okay. bit. Okay. Uh, I grew up in uh, a city that's called Chernovitz. It is a city uh, between borders. It was always, the borders were always shifting. Uh, during my lifetime, uh, it's about, there were about three uh, countries there, at least. Uh, I was born, it was Romania. Uh, then it was uh, after 1940, it was the Soviet Union. And now it is Ukraine. This is a particular city because uh, uh, in many ways it was one of the uh, uh, very rare occasions where you can be live in the Soviet Union and be surrounded all the time by Jews. Uh, most of the population of the city were Jews, uh, at least about 60% of the population, and you could uh, live and converse in Yiddish, uh, you were going in the street and uh, everybody uh, could know this language and uh, your family language was also Yiddish for sure and uh, there was quite a um, uh, developed uh, re religious life in this city although in the whole Soviet Union that wasn't so. Uh, I had my bar mitzvah already in Soviet times uh, I uh, could lay tefillin, I have done it until the age at least uh, 18, uh, although in the Soviet Union that was uh, not so much uh, uh, acceptable. And uh, you could uh, live a Jewish life, but you have to be silent, you, didn't, wouldn't have, you have to do it in secret, and not telling anybody about what was going on in your family and your and your surroundings, uh, family surroundings, and all that. So uh, I lived there uh, for quite a number of years in Chernovitz, and when uh, the time came for me to enter the university, uh, sure I couldn't do it there because. Uh, of the local anti-Semitism, because uh, not many Jews were accepted to the local university in Chernovitz. Chernovitz is a city with quite a uh, rich cultural history. Uh, in 1908, uh, in uh, this city, uh, they called uh, an international conference in which it was, uh, for the first time in history, uh, it was, uh, at least in recent, in modern history, uh, it was declared that Yiddish and Hebrew are national languages of the Jewish people. It was a part of uh, Jewish revival uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, so uh, I couldn't uh, continue my education uh, in this uh, city. I have to go somewhere else. And I went to Moscow, where actually I made all my uh, scholarly career until my Aliyah to Eretz Yisrael, which I've done in 1971. It was the early Aliyah to Eretz Yisrael. Uh, we uh, lived, I, our family was quite a traditional family. We lived uh, the usual life of a traditional Jewish family with keeping uh, as much as possible mitzvahs, uh, eating only kosher meat, uh, uh, it was available, uh, although it, uh, it was uh, by Soviet laws illeg illegal, but it was available if you wanted to get it uh, in, uh, uh, in this city. Uh, and uh, there were synagogues working. At the same time, the secular life, Jewish, was also until uh, it was uh, cut down by this by the by Stalin was still uh, um, it was still uh, uh, functioning so there was a Yiddish theater there uh, which was functioning until uh, 1948 there was a Yiddish school uh, functioning there until 1950 but after that already uh, Jewish life there uh, was uh, very much uh, 
official Jewish life was very much prohibited. And uh, when uh, even a group of uh, local Jews uh, wanted to erect a um, monument at the Jewish cemetery to the victims of the Second World War uh, and uh, have written their, uh, their text, uh, uh, mem memorial text uh, for, on, on, this, uh, on this monument, then immediately the local Communist Party authorities uh, got uh, uh, immediately uh, uh, active. They uh, moved in and they prohibited uh, this inscription, replacing it by a new inscription that this is a, um, a uh, uh, monument to Soviet citizens, uh, peaceful Soviet citizens that were, that were uh, 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 murdered by, by Nazis. Uh, so uh, that was uh, that was uh, our life there. Chernovitz was also uh, very uh, interesting from the point of view that from Chernovitz, Jews could always, even in the worst years of the Stalin regime, uh, emigrate, uh, make aliyah to Eretz Yisrael. Uh, so, but mainly it was done uh, by uh, uh, semi-legal uh, ways. Uh, so. Uh, somebody paid a bribe, and for this bribe, he got permission to get out of the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, so, in 1988, if you look at the numbers of uh, Jews who emigrated uh, from uh, uh, from uh, Chernovitz, from the Soviet Union to er to Eretz uh, you see that uh, most of those who emigrated were from one city, Chernovitz. Uh, and so we, and the rest were from whatever it is, all the other places in the vast country of the Soviet Union. Uh, it's explained by many facts, and one of the facts was that, uh, 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 first of all, uh, there was a more liberal attitude towards, uh, uh, towards Aliyah and immigration on the part of Soviet authorities uh, in Chernobyl and in other places. And also by the Zionist spirit of the uh, of the uh, Jews in this city, uh, I was very happy that I actually, and I'm very happy that I actually grew up in such a Jew, in such Jewish surroundings, although not in a very hospitable place for Jews as the Soviet Union. Uh, Chernovitz, uh, it was quite quite a very uh, a rare place uh, uh, in Eastern Europe. The Chernobyl is also interesting from another point of view because it was the only place in uh, Eastern Europe where 20,000 Jews uh, lived through the war. Uh, uh, they were left there as, so to say, useful professional uh, people and uh, uh, it was under Romanian occupation and uh, uh, the rest of the Jews there of 20,000, the general population was about uh, 60,000 Jews in this city, uh, the rest were, um, were actually deported to the concentration camps of Transnistria. Uh, so my young years were uh, among people who actually uh, survived survive the war, so Jewish survivors, of, uh, of concentration camps of Transnistria and that was marked actually all my life after that and uh, uh, also my interest uh, in research uh, is very much connected with these uh, uh, events, tragic events uh, of, uh, of 1939-1945 that happened uh, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, actually in the whole Europe as such. Thank you, Dr. Glass, for your kindness. Can I just I really appreciate it. Wolf, what year were you born in? I was born in Romania, uh, some uh, not far away from, from Chernovitz. But what year? Uh, uh, in 1936, uh, 1936, so by now I'm 86 years old. Oh. Yeah. Ken and, her. and your family, did the majority of the family survive the Shire? 
Uh, no, uh, the majority of my family, uh, I am one of the few people of my family that actually remained alive. Okay, although it was very tragic, tragic history. And a part of my family, I even don't know where they are buried because they were not buried. They actually, there was a transport. We were all, whatever it is, had to, to march uh, on foot for hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. And as people could continue and they fell by the road, they were shot. And in this way, uh, members of my family were actually uh, were actually murdered. So we don't know actually even exactly, they don't have, they don't have their, their whatever it is, their, their, we don't know whether, 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 whether where, they, where their remains lie, simply don't know. It was on the road, on the road, for thousands of kilometers. And then there was a river, and the Dniester, and uh, those people who were in the column, they were taken over the river on, uh, on barges, and, uh, and uh, on the way, the Romanian, whatever it is, soldiers and all that, were throwing them into the, shooting at them and throwing them into the river. So not, not all of the people who actually were in this column across the river. And then they were, the people in the column were uh, led by the soldiers, by the Romanian occupiers, into the terrain of Podolia and uh, they were not given any kind of, I don't want to continue on that because after that is I'm getting very, very excited and uh, very, very, whatever, I couldn't do it. I can't. Well, Max, thank you continue. so much. Okay, I really appreciate it. Max. But it was very yeah. tragic, tragic times. It was very, very tragic times. And um, during the first, uh, the, during the first, uh, winter of 1941, most of the people who were actually driven there into these camps in Transnistria, most of them died of uh, typhus, typhoid fever, and uh, and uh, and uh, famine, and uh, and uh, already there were very very I mean few survivors actually. Uh, so. Uh, uh, it's always whatever it is. I can't. I can't continue about that. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I just ask, Max? What message do you give, or can you impart? What Having gone through what you went through, what and message I can give. I can give to the I next generations, to the future uh, generations. I don't have for the whole humanity. I don't have a message, but for the Jewish people, I have a message. You should. You should never forget. Forget. That there is a, a big world, and this big world is not always uh, friendly to Jews. And you should always remember that there is always some lurking somewhere, some danger. And uh, you should be aware of it, and uh, you should take care of yourselves. Well, and it concerns Jews everywhere, Jews in Israel, Jews all, all over the world. You can, should never, because I am very much afraid that the young people simply don't know the past, because you have to know the historical chain. If you remember the historical chain, it means from where we came, why we are Jews, why are remaining Jews, why we are remaining Jews, what connect, what connect, what brings us together, what, what is the sense of our existence as Jews, then you have then you have some feeling, whatever it is, of what you have to do, how you have to behave and all that. But the young people I'm afraid of today, they don't have, I, I'm speaking about the secular part of the population. They don't have this idea. They don't know from where they came and where they, where they, where they are going. And uh, that's very much disturbing me. And I'm sp I'm speaking about the secular part for sure of the of the of the, of, the, of the Jewish population. It concerns if you come to Israel and you're secular, you're not safe. 
you are still not safe because the assimilation here is very very much uh, very much uh, so to say um, I would say rampant and uh, Israelis easily intermarry you don't have to live in America to intermarry you can be an Israeli and you can intermarry they are bringing in their non-Jewish uh, uh, wives here which don't convert and uh, and uh, that's is it our next generations and uh, we have to think about it so I think that Jewish education is extremely extremely important the quality of Jewish education and, uh, and uh, I think that Jewish education should be shouldn't be so to say, neglected uh, because we have to think about future if there is if we have as a, as a people the future we have to cling to our values and to our traditions thank you so much yeah. and I just wonder the last question are you happy that you you made Aliyah that you came to Israel I am happy that I made Aliyah that was the idea of my life actually because in 1930s part of our family already made Aliyah before us and we were in permanent contact with our relatives I mean about my, my, my nuclear family uh, with with our relatives in Israel uh, we corresponded with them all this time all these years we received parcels from them with matzes and uh, so we had matzes every year and all that and uh, we so the idea that our place is not in such an unfriendly place for Jews as Soviet Union was always there and we always knew that we have to whatever it is that we have to uh, to make Aliyah to, to come to Israel and uh, and so at the first uh, occasion I've done it and it was in 1971 and what I am I am only sorry that I could come earlier yeah, if I could come earlier you know although maybe I wouldn't have got such an education as I got in Moscow because I got an excellent education there and uh, I had all the opportunities for my development, my career. And at the peak of my career already there, I, uh, I left. And uh, people couldn't understand how a person can destroy everything that built for many years and just go somewhere, you know. But you landed, uh, you were in, in Oxford as well? Uh, I was, no, I was came on education, uh, on invitation. To, to Jerusalem because my pupils already were here uh, at the university teaching here so they I was I got an invitation from one university in Moscow to another university in Jerusalem so I didn't have any problems because I came I had a job before I came even here but in England you you okay one moment my permanent place all these years were in at the Hebrew University in addition to that, when I had my uh, sabbaticals, I went to various to, to England mainly and to and to the into the states, and I taught at several universities. Among them were uh, Oxford University, summer courses of Yiddish, which I was teaching there Yiddish linguistics and all that. London University of London. Uh, then there was uh, Cornell University, University of Pennsylvania. Wow and uh, Toronto University I taught everywhere there and I taught also in Italian universities uh, okay that's it well I just want to thank you so much just <clears throat> and if I yes. can do this <clears throat> it really it's uh, been the greatest honor and privilege and thank you so very much thank you very and much you just have muzzle broche and good health Thank you. And maybe it's ring, and from the bottom of my heart, I'm so grateful to you. Thank you, Dr. Glassman. And it's been the greatest honor and privilege. I have a, it's a great privilege to know you. Thank you. Is your telephone so wonderful? <laughs> <laughs>